Brothers and sisters, time after time, we've been moved by the parable of the Good Samaritan. We are reminded that we can make a difference by our care, by our compassion, by our generosity, and that we are called to do so for our family members and also for strangers. With us today is Sister Patricia Cataldi of the Missionary Sisters of the Precious Blood. As she reflects with us on the message of the Good Samaritan and shares with us about her ministry and the, and the ministry of the sisters of her religious order, I ask you please to open your hearts to the ways that you can live in the spirit of the Good Samaritan and support the mission of the Sisters of the Precious Blood by your prayers and by your generosity. Thank you, Father Paul, for your welcome to Christ the King. It's always good to be here. I am Sister Pat Cataldi, a member of the Missionary Sisters of the Precious Blood. And on behalf of our sisters, I want to thank Bishop Stowe and the Diocese of Lexington for again being invited to participate in the Mission Co-op Program with 14 other missionary groups. The collection is equally divided among the groups as well with the Diocese of Lexington for its own mission work. And while we have many second collections, this is the only one which requires the presence of a speaker. And I'm always happy to participate in this appeal as it gives me the opportunity to speak about the missions our call to be missionaries by virtue of our baptism and visit the parishes of the diocese. First, a brief introduction. I was born on a tobacco farm in Connecticut, and in keeping with the state's motto, he who transplants sustains, have been transplanted a number of times. I came to Kentucky by a very circuitous route. From Connecticut, I went to Pennsylvania, where I entered the convent, attended nursing school, university, and medical school. Then a residency in general surgery in New Jersey was followed by five years in St. Lucia in the West Indies, where I was surrounded by water. In contrast, the next 12 years were spent in Zimbabwe, where we measured rainfall in millimeters. Returning to the States in 2000 and looking for an area of medical need, I came to Eastern Kentucky, first to Floyd County and then to Louisa and Lawrence County, where I still live and belong to St. Jude Parish. And to top it off, I'm from the same town in Connecticut as Katie Shepherd, your Director of Advancement, another transplant. We usually think of missionaries of the, as being in foreign lands, learning a different language, and adapting to same, some strange foods. And I have done that. I've tried amantimbi or mopani worms, which are actually caterpillars, which I did not like, and flying ants, which I did like. But even in Kentucky, there were some language differences. The first Sunday when I was at Mass at St. Martha's in Prestonsburg, the Knights of Columbus had a spaghetti dinner after Mass. And I went to this dinner and wanted to meet some of the people, and everyone was talking about UK, UK. And I thought, not too many people in the States pay attention to world news, and I'm in the mountains of eastern Kentucky and they're talking about England? I didn't say anything, but the next few days at the hospital, it was again, UK, UK, the light dawn, the University of Kentucky, basketball. So we even learned to adapt in this country. An, insur an insurance commercial that has been aired for some time on TV asks the question, are you in good hands? In today's gospel, we heard the well-known story of the Good Samaritan. He saw a man who had been left half dead, or half alive. Maybe he had a 50-50 chance of survival, 
but only if something was done, something to tip the scales in favor of life. Because of one man's mercy and compassion, one man's care, he did live. He was in good hands. In Zimbabwe, the greeting, which is the equivalent of hello, is salibonani, which literally means, I am seeing you. The Samaritan saw a person in need, recognized his neighbor, who was loved by God, and intervened. We're all called to love God and love our neighbor. And a definition of love, which kind of works for me, is a short phrase, to love is to give life. That is how God loves us and how we are to love our neighbor. In 1885, our congregation was founded in South Africa by a Trappist, Abbot Francis Fanner, to share the gospel with the Zulu women. Today, we are about 900 sisters serving in 20 countries and engaged in a variety of ministries. Where do we witness to God's love? How do we give life today? In South Africa, the birthplace of our congregation, the sisters started schools, hospitals, teacher and nurse training schools, as has been done in a number of countries. But then they discovered that those with disabilities, especially cerebral palsy, were neglected and hidden away at home. That was the beginning of Ikwesi Lokusa, or Morning Star, which provides education, community living, corrective surgery, as well as vocational training and the chance to live a full life. Some years ago, in the middle of the night, a policeman came to one of our convents with two young children who were left orphaned and homeless because of AIDS. Sister Mary Paul, who had grown up on a ranch in Idaho in response to the need of these children, began Bethany Home for AIDS orphans. But with the increase of AIDS, we also, also saw many children also suffering from AIDS who had been infected before birth. In my first year in Zimbabwe, I saw two new cases of AIDS, but by my fifth year there, we were seeing over 500 new HIV AIDS cases per year, and this at a rural hospital. There was a little boy there named Future, only Future didn't have much of a future. He had AIDS. He was cared for by an elderly grandmother, but the hospital became his second home because of TB and recurrent respiratory infections. We had many children at the hospital who were in for treatment, whether for TB or other illnesses that required long-term treatment. So they would then be sent to the um, school on the mission compound. So one day they came back, we had about six at one time attending school, and one day they came back to the hospital and said, Dr. Taylor, tomorrow's Parents' Day. And I said, so? Well, they expected me to go to meet their teachers. So I went over and I'm in line with all these mothers and they're all kind of looking at me and laughing because they knew who I was. So I went to the various teachers and we had two in the second grade, Wisdom and Future. And the teacher said, Wisdom is doing very well, it's not a problem, but Future, he's not very talented or gifted, but it's not just that, he's lazy, and we don't know how to you know, get him to really study. Even the other children were trying to help him. So a few days later, back at the hospital, I found out this little boy who really was quite lazy had a little business going on. One of the sisters would get things from home like balloons and different things, and Future was selling the balloons for 10 cents and, you know, making a little profit there. But this little boy who really had nothing except what he was making from his little sales was at church one Sunday, and I usually sat on the side with the kids from the hospital. And Future had two little coins, which he put on the, the bench. Only they didn't come to us, you know, with the collection basket. And he looked at me, and I nodded, so he went. 
and he gave his two coins into the offertory collection. And I always remember the widow with her two coins, and I always remember future when I hear that gospel. In the largest slum of Nairobi, our sisters minister to street kids, as well as the homeless elderly. Life on the streets leaves many deep scars, many of which are invisible. So love and trust have been lacking in that struggle for survival, and there the human spirit has to be healed. All of the ministries basically focus on meeting and seeing the individual, on sharing God's love for that individual. One of the first questions I was asked when I came to Zimbabwe was by a gardener who said to me, did you come for us? In Zimbabwe, I was one of two doctors at a 180-bed hospital near the Botswana border with five outreach clinics. People struggled to get food during the many years of drought and walked miles to school, hospital, church, or simply to get safe water. We had one little boy whose name was Meloleki, and his grandmother walked three days to bring him to the hospital. He was so severely malnourished that he looked like a little old man and got the nickname Kulu, which means grandfather. No one thought he would live. He was half dead. But he was in good hands, and he did go home healthy and well-nourished. Of course, good hands are not always enough, as medicine and other treatments are necessary. Even today, essential medicines which are in short supply in many countries can only be accessed due to the generosity of donors. Even more basic than medicine is the need for food and water. Many countries are in danger of mass starvation due to drought and war. And here again, NGOs and churches rely on donors to alleviate this suffering. Some years ago, my brother visited me and I gave him a tour of Eastern Kentucky. And on the way, we stopped at one of the churches where one of the sisters was being given a farewell party. And I introduced him to a number of people. And many of them said, well, we're not originally from here. We were volunteers from Indiana or New York and settled here. When we left, my brother said, isn't there anyone from here? He said, what is this, witness protection program? Why are they here? One of the first questions I was asked when I came to Kentucky was, how long will you stay? Sometimes it's simply presence that is important that one stays with the people. This was seen by our sisters during the long civil war in Mozambique, and now with our sisters in Sudan who are in the disputed area of the Nuba Mountains. People there face daily bombings from their own government, especially during certain seasons. seasons. Foxholes are everywhere, and along with everyone else, the sisters seek shelter in those foxholes. Schools and hospitals are not spared. Raising crops is difficult because of the need to constantly seek shelter. But the church remains with the people there. The priests and sisters walk many miles to teach and assist the people. Catechists are trained and they too spread the good news, giving freely of their time. Donations are often sought to be able to give them a small stipend to somehow repay them for their dedicated and faithful service. We never know how we may touch another person. When I went to the uh, Big Sandy Federal Prison, a maximum security prison in Martin County, I was going through a procedure I was explaining to one of the prisoners, and um, he said to me, are you a Christian? And I said, yes, as a matter of fact, I'm a Catholic nun. He said, a nun? I said, that's right. He said, a nun. And you could see the wheels kind of turning in his head, a nun. You don't marry. I said, that's right. He said, a nun. Like Mother Teresa, I'm there, you got it, that's me. But no, I thought, here is this prisoner in a maximum security prison 
who probably never met Mother Teresa, but somehow knew about her, and her life had touched him enough that he remembered. So while today I'm asking for financial help, I'm asking even more for your prayers for all missionaries, especially those in difficult and even dangerous situations. The insurance commercial to which I referred ends with the child's voice changing into the deep voice of the insurance agent, listing the benefits of their insurance and asking, are you in good hands? We often hear, Christ has no hands but yours. Let our hearts direct our words, our hands, so that when we reach out in compassion and mercy, when we truly see our neighbor, we bring the good news of God's love for that person. We are that child becoming the face of Christ for others. Let us continue our mission of giving life. Thank you.